Hi, this is Dr. Hart, and this video is about natural and social sciences. Natural sciences. Natural sciences study nature. Examples include physics, chemistry, astronomy, even though some consider astronomy a subfield of physics, geology, meteorology, oceanography, biology, botany, zoology, paleontology, and some subfields of geography. So physical geography would be a natural science. Cultural geography would fall into social sciences. Let's talk about the scientific method. So, a scientific way of studying things heavily depends on the inductive method. And what is inductive method about? It's about making observations that are specific, and then on the basis of those observations, you proceed to general conclusions. So, what is the first step of the scientific method? First, you observe events, right? Second, you notice patterns. How do you notice patterns? Patterns are for free. We are biologically wired to notice them. Then you formulate an educated guess, almost also known as the hypothesis, based on the patterns that you notice. Then you test your hypothesis over and over, and uh, this is the essence of the experimental method. So once you observe and notice patterns and formulate your hypothesis, this is when you proceed with your experiment. And if you test the hypothesis over and over again, and uh, you do not refute it, then you elevate that hypothesis into a scientific law. You may also call it a law of nature. So that's how science is done. And then if you come up with a theory, uh, then you produce an overarching explanation a general explanation of how things work, and this is what we call a scientific theory. Examples of scientific theories include Newton's mechanics, quantum theory, special relativity theory, general relativity theory, germ theory of disease, etc. So a theory is not something that pops into one's head. It's not just an idea that has occurred to someone. A scientific theory is really the last and the grandest step in the scientific method. This is the uh, overarching explanation for a scientific law or for a series, for a network of related scientific laws. So the scientific method, to sum it all up, is really uh, the combination of uh, the inductive method and the experimental method. Scientific laws can usually be stated uh, in both concise language and precise mathematical formulations. For example, Newton, uh, Newton's laws of motion, there are three laws of motion and, four law, and one law of gravity for the total of four laws uh, of Newton. And um, you can see them if you're watching this video, not just listening, but watching, you can see the formulas for those laws and also verbal formulation for formulations for the laws of motion. All right, so uh, the power of scientific laws is their conciseness, uh, both in terms of mathematical expressions and uh, expressions in natural languages such as English. All right, so from science in general, from the, from the natural sciences and the scientific method in general, we proceed now to ask the question, what is political science? Because this is our subject, right? So political science studies politics, and you will recall that politics is all about power. So political science studies power. It asks a number of specific questions about power, such as how people get and lose power, how they use it, uh, why they use it in a specific way, etc. Another way of seeing the same thing is to say that political science studies power relationships in society. Political science, therefore, is a social science. A social science is an objective approach to the study of society. Other social sciences include sociology, anthropology, archaeology, history, economics, psychology, linguistics, and some areas of geography, like cultural geography. So what's different about political science compared to other social sciences? 
unlike other social sciences, political science does not have a lot of its own concepts. Probably the only concept that is endogenous, that is to say internal to political science, is the concept of power. Other social sciences are full of their own, their own endogenous concepts. For example, in economics, you have supply, you have demand, you have prices, wages, frictional unemployment, structural unemployment, and so on. In psychology, you have whole object relations, you have object constancy, you have external objects, internal objects, personality disorders, and so on. So political science uh, is very sparse on its own concepts. Instead, what it does is it borrows from other social sciences. It's like the mixed martial arts of social sciences, whereby mixed martial arts borrow techniques from all the various styles. So does political science borrow concepts from other social sciences in order to convert them into an effective way of studying power. In addition to borrowing from other social sciences, political science also has borrowed from philosophy. Before the 20th century, philosophy, which is love of wisdom, of course, in Greek, philosophy was widely considered the queen of all sciences. Obviously, this is no longer the case. Philosophy belongs to the humanities. Uh, even though some subfields of philosophy use mathematical and logical concepts, notation, and reasoning. But of course, for the early development of political science, philosophy, particularly the branch of philosophy called political philosophy, was important to the development of political science. Let's talk in general about the limitations of social sciences. There are few generally scientific theories in the social sciences and probably none in political science per se. This has to do with our inability to apply the experimental method to most political situations. This is why the social sciences are sometimes called soft sciences, and this is why some people deny that they are sciences at all. However, this does not mean that they are entirely subjective. On the contrary, through the inductive method of systematic empirical observation, we have discovered many patterns that reveal much about how politics works in the real world. We found many correlations. Correlations are empirical relationships that often can be expressed with great mathematical precision. However, our inability to apply the experimental method to most problems of politics in the real world means that we can say very little about causation. So, we know of relationships, we have direct relationships, where two or more variables are headed in the same direction, we have indirect or inverse relationships, where variables are headed in different direction, and we have correlations, which are mathematical expressions of relationships but relationships are not causations. So, there's very little that we can say about causation in uh, political science. So, we see that uh, the social sciences rely on observation, on the comparative method. They can compare uh, cultures uh, uh, in the same time, cultures that exist at the same time. They, compa they can compare cultures over time. Uh, they can also compare, uh, you know, it, its own culture uh, over a period of time. For example, American uh, culture today in all of its expressions, uh, from legal to scientific, technological, and artistic, to the way that American culture existed uh, early on, let's say in the early 18th century. So, the comparative method and observation and speculation is pretty much all that we can uh, go with in political science. Of course, we can apply sophisticated statistical methods to try to control uh, for intervening variables, try to eliminate them the best we can to clarify what is really happening, to clarify our empirical relationships but uh, we can almost never proceed to 
uh, confident assertions of uh, causation. So how do you know that a science is at best a soft science? Two things. First, it rarely, if ever, uses the experimental method. And second, it is good at explaining, but is hit and miss in predicting. Remember that an explanation may be true or false, irrespective of whether it is convincing. A very convincing explanation may nevertheless be false. So these two things, one is in the method, lack of experimental method, that gives it away. And the second one is the, the exit part, what comes out, right? That's predictions. Predictions are often incorrect in political science, uh, and uh, that's a dead giveaway that you're not dealing with a hard science. You are dealing with, at best, a soft science. A scientific prediction has to be specific and testable. It specifically states what or when something will happen um, in terms of that do not allow for equivocation. Equivocation is a vague statement that can be interpreted in more than one way, and these multiple ways of interpretation can be mutually exclusive, self-contradictory. Let's uh, mention here an important kind of practical side note. Charlatans and fake gurus uh, are not scientists. And charlatans and fake gurus just want your money or energy. So they hook you in with predictions that you want to hear. And when such predictions fail to come true, they will use one or more of the following tactics. They will move forward the time of the predicted event. So someone might say, by 2019, cars will drive themselves. And when that doesn't happen, they will just say, well, wait another 20 years. I'm still right. I was just a little bit too early in my prediction. And they will do it as if it's not a big deal, as if timing doesn't matter. It matters. Another tactic they may use is uh, they will equ equivocate by changing the meaning of their prediction. And they will do it using the uh, vagueness of language, right? So they will say, well, this is not really what I meant by uh, all handheld electronic devices disappearing and being in our brains. This is not really what I, me I meant, uh, because you can see that we already have electronic devices like a, a chip, a computer chip that can be implanted in one's brain. And they will say that um, forgetting right, about the most important part, and that is the disappearance of all handheld devices. So they will concentrate on only the second part of their prediction and present it as if it were the entirety of their prediction to make themselves uh, look correct. And they will also mess with your sense with reality. That's another tactic uh, which uh, a lot of these charlatans and fake gurus use, and also a lot of disordered personalities like uh, psychopaths and narcissists use to try to gaslight you and confabulate things that haven't really happened. So they will say, well, you misunderstood or misread or misheard my true prediction. This is not what I predicted. It's, uh, you're, you're just misunderstanding me. So predictions uh, really is a tricky business. And the charlatans and fake gurus, fake prophets who become rich by making these predictions exploit people's lack of scientific understanding and people's hopes over, uh, over rational approach, rational scientific approach, because... People want to believe that their preferred outcomes will eventually become true. And by doing so, they expose themselves to psychological and financial exploitation. So here we see that scientific method can actually be very practically used as a guard, as a protection of oneself, 
against being taken advantage of by, by charlatans and fake prophets. What is American politics? I don't now mean American politics as a process. I mean American politics as a subfield of political science. So it's one of its many subfields. Other subfields of political science include comparative politics, also uh, known as area studies, international relations, political theory, public administration, public policy, political methodology, political economy, constitutional law and legal studies. And American politics itself can be broken down into many subfields. If you open up any textbook on American politics and read uh, chapter titles, those chapter titles can roughly correspond to various subfields of American politics. So areas or subfields like political parties, interest groups, law and courts, state and local politics, uh, public opinion and uh, political behavior, media and communication studies, uh, various policy areas like environmental politics, also identity and minority politics. All of these would be subfields of American politics, which itself is a subfield of political science. So, with this, thank you for your attention, and see you in the next lecture.